Hey, everybody. Welcome to the PC Perspective Podcast. Uh, we're actually already like 20 minutes into the show. We just decided we'd finally start recording things. This is episode 204, recording it on May 30th, 2012. I am Ryan Shrout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walrath. And I'm Alan Malventano. So, uh, Josh, why don't you pose this question to us once again? Well, we were having a discussion uh, earlier on recorded that uh, about sound cards. I mentioned Asus has a new set coming out, and they've upgraded their Zonar series. And I asked, what was the last creative sound card that you actually bought or you know, had installed in a machine? Because I know that they just came out with their, what, core 3D-based uh, chips, which put all kinds of functionality on the chip itself, but, but doesn't that actually expand any of the functionality whatsoever? And so you look at those cards, and they're kind of bare, and there was you know much discussion about the quality of creative drivers and their installation procedures, so I was kind of curious. When's the last time you dipped your toe into that particular pool or other parts of your anatomy? Uh, for me, it would be the uh, original X Fi. And well, what have actually, you Actually, yeah, me too, actually. Yeah. Same thing. I, yeah, I know. I, I think that honestly, the last one that I ever bought physically was an old ISA AW64. <laughs> honestly, I have not had a sound card in awesome. ages. Unfortunately, that means I also can't play Battlefield 2 because, well, Punk Buster does not get along with onboard video or onboard audio in some cases. But no, it's just been forever since I bought them because I don't need high end audio, and that's what the sound card market is now. You, you can spend 200 and some dollars easily. I consider myself more, more interested in audio cards today than I was even a couple of years ago, uh, mostly because of the work that we do in like video and audio editing and that kind of stuff. In that, when you really start to listen to, if you're doing recordings, it makes a big difference, right? Um, and, and we're actually working with, with Asus to get uh, some of their, a couple of their external units in uh, to use for our video production systems to try to alleviate some of the noise that we might uh, be getting through interference with onboard audio. It seemed, but it, you know, it's something that it's, you know, we're, we're using like a, a 16 channel mixer, Mackie brand mixer, like kind of, you know, pro, pro level quality stuff. And at the end of the day, our out, out of it <laughs> is uh, into a mini jack line input on a PC. And that just just feels stupid, right? It just feels dumb at the end of the day to do that. So, but I mean, the whole advent of like the USB based sound cards and all that kind of stuff to me kind of alleviated the need for uh, a physically installed like PCI or PCI Express based sound card, right? Yeah. Yeah. The, the only reason I. Um Actually, I'm, I've, I don't think I've ever bought any sound card just for the audio input stuff. Because for anything that's audio input, there's always noise. Even for, even for PCI Express or any of those cards, it's, it's really hard to get um, you know, just complete noise-free audio. You really have to get one of the higher-end cards that have like an mm -hmm. EM shield around the thing, you know, with a you know, big metal wraparound, that, that sort of deal. Um, so for anything that's audio input related, even the like the cheesiest little C media chip based USB to, you know, like those little dongle things that come with some of the USB headsets, where the headset actually right. has the two phono jacks, but you just they just throw like this extra thing in the box, that gives you so much better audio. You know, I mean, maybe the the like the sample rate or whatever might not be crazy. You know, ninety six kilohertz or whatever, way up there, one hundred ninety two kilohertz, but the the audio will just be cleaner. Right, because it's it's just it's not sitting inside your PC case. That's like an EM war zone, especially if you're like an overclocker and have a bunch of other stuff going on in there. It's basically here's this big steel box with a bunch of <laughs> MI, you know, a bunch of electromagnetic Signals bouncing stuff going inside on. of it. Yeah, and they're all bouncing around inside of it. They're all concentrated in there. And then let's try try to put you know some kind of audio stuff in there and expect to get a clean signal. And what really killed me was when you see those cards that have like the gold plated connectors on the back. It's like, oh yes, I'm cleanly getting my very noisy <laughs> signal. Um, yeah, but but the reason that I get any of those, you know, higher end or, you know, cleaner sounding cards is for the output, right? 
just so that you know, uh, um, I just don't like relying on USB for output for some reason. Yeah. Maybe because there's not a lot of good solutions out there. There's a few things. You know, every once in a while you see someone come out with a good external USB or USB, what, 3 now they have, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. Audio yeah. solutions. Um, USB 3, be I say, because it, it's the, you actually want the higher bandwidth, believe it or not. You're, you're not actually going to use the higher bandwidth, like actually taxing it. But the reason you want the higher bandwidth is so that you minimize the delay. Because there's actually delay introduced when you try to do USB 2 and... It has to packetize the, the the audio, and there's actually some latency, you know, that gets added in there depending on how your setup is, how the, you know how the solution was worked out. But um, with USB three, it reduces the latency significantly. So that's just something I'll throw out there, I guess. I still haven't switched myself. I'm still on uh, Asus uh, Zonar, like a D1 or a DX or one of those, and I probably won't change until the thing dies. I don't think any of my computers have audio cards in them anymore, actually. Really? I don't think anything I use, I think it's either onboard or some kind of USB device. So, hmm, interesting. Huh. Um, so let's go through some of the things that happened this week. First of all, I think we posted this since the last podcast, but we do have a, we didn't, we have a, a PC uh, our readers, and our viewers to um, take this survey. And uh, it's really quick. It's maybe like five minutes. It asks you for, you know, your region, your age, your income range, and what kind of products you're interested in seeing. Uh, if you want to see notebook reviews, if you want to see tablet reviews, when you're going to upgrade your processor, those types of things. Uh, and in exchange, we will give you the opportunity to win prizes like uh, Vertex 4 SSD, Corsair Vengeance C70, chassis or gigabyte z71 z77 g1 sniper m3 motherboard that's their micro atx option so uh i believe i said the survey runs through june 8th so you do have just over a week now to uh, get your entry in and uh, you get to control the future of pc perspective and i told people in this um, that if you write in the comments section that we should fire josh if enough people vote for that, we have to do it. But I guess there was one commenter that said we weren't allowed to do that. Is that right, Josh? Yeah, well, you were not allowed. I'm so was disappointed it? I missed out on the rest of the sound card because I just had this long line of creative products that I've shuffled through my computer. But anyway, back to your survey. We don't want to. We don't want to. We don't want to go down. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to go down too far down the creative rabbit hole. We could have hours and hours of discussion of that. And frankly, I would bored everybody to tears. Um, so what else is happening this week? Uh, we didn't actually have any other reviews go up except for that. Alan is going to talk to us a little bit about, um, I, I safe solo pro and Synology dicks. Whoops, whoops, whoops. <laughs> disc <laughs> station, <laughs> disc <laughs> station, uh, two twelve review. Ryan, Oof. Ryan wants Oof. to. Ryan's a little too eager to mount his storage Oof. tonight, folks. Um, yeah, that's right. So <laughs> yeah, it's about disaster-proof network storage, please. Mm. Okay. So I'll start out with the Synology box. So here's a Synology Disk Station Two Twelve Plus. Really lightweight. Um, actually, surprisingly lightweight, especially considering. It, uh, it has two hard drives installed. It has two one terabyte, uh, I think they're Seagate or Hitachi or one of those uh, drives installed in it. So this thing's actually pretty cool. Um, it's just, this, you know, one of your typical NAS type boxes, but really small. Um, has a SD card and a USB 2.0 slot on the front. And then on the back, these guys really didn't mess around with connectivity. It has two USB 3 slots, gigabit Ethernet, and eSATA. So... With this one box, not only do you have the internal storage in there, but you have basically anything else you want to you know, connect to the thing and just have sitting off to the side of it. Um, so it's almost like its own little mini PC for the purposes of just storage. Um, so it's pretty good, and it gets pretty good numbers for Samba-based sharing. I was seeing like 50, 60 megabytes per second on reads and writes, that sort of thing. Um, so pretty good. I mean, Samba has some overhead, overhead to it, but... Um, there is a 2 gigahertz, I believe, ARM-based processor. 
in this guy. So it mm -hmm. definitely can handle the, you know, the extra overhead for Samba shares and stuff like that. Um, then here's the cool part. You take this, which is really good for bridging eSATA over to your network of your home. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. if you say you want to protect your storage from a fire, you take this big, heavy thing, which actually only has one one terabyte hard drive in it, but it's definitely beefy. Could you and describe the size of that device that you were holding that contains uh, one single three and a half inch hard drive? What's the see. size of a toaster, big, isn't it? It's bigger than a toaster. Yeah, definitely <laughs> much heavier. Um, this is uh, the IOSafe Solo Pro, and on the back of it, you have a fan and it's only USB 2, but it also has eSATA sitting right underneath the uh, on-off switch. So you could basically take this, take a Synology box, stick it on top of the thing, stick it in the back corner of your closet, somewhere mm -hmm. in the back of the house, right? Oh, put it on you your network. These, are you forcing these things back in the closet? I mean, it's not very pc -y, yeah? Well, then, yeah, you know, they, they'll, come at, they'll come out eventually. Um, so you put them in there. Uh, you can actually bolt this guy to the floor. It's literally meant to be a safe. If you look at the back here, there's a couple of very large screw holes. Maybe don't and do this in your apartment. <laughs> no, don't do it to an apartment. It's not really meant to do it to an apartment. But the idea is that um, the material in this guy is uh, the consumable plastic material that you see in those fire, uh, fireproof safes, basically. The ones that have the really thick walls to them. If you've ever seen them, if you Google around on like Amazon or something, you'll see, you know, these uh, safe kind of things that it's like two, three inches thick of this consumable plastic. So basically the, the, the material burns off and with it doing its phase change, it, 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 um, it sacrifices itself for the rest of whatever, you know, is inside, basically. So inside that steel case is a, that material surrounding a one terabyte Hitachi hard drive. Uh, I think they sell them with one, two, or three terabytes. Um, the price just, you know, obviously varies based on the, the capacity. But the cool part is that th there's some videos on uh, IOSafe's website of all the different things they've done to these. And I can't even replicate that stuff here, short of, you know, lighting a barn on fire with this thing in there or something like that. But um, Do it. Throw it away. Do it. From all the tests that they've done... Uh, the thing definitely lives up to the name. So, yeah, they've like put it on, you know, fire and then dropped it from a, uh, you know, from a bulldozer, with the arm all the way up, and that was after it was on fire. And then they like stuck it in a bunch of water and busted everything open. And you know, chances are the electronics that drives the USB and the eSATA ports in the back, they're probably toast. So you're probably not just gonna like plug this guy back into a computer straight away. But they, you can definitely open the case and pull the hard drive out. And chances are the hard drive itself will be intact so you can get the data back. Um, and they do a huge, uh, it's like, I think it's like a lifetime warranty or some very long duration warranty where you have to register it for this to apply. But basically, if you've registered it, um, they'll even do a uh, cover data recovery for the full contents of the drive. So let's say there is that fire and for some reason, you know, the hard drive did something fried on the hard drive too. Um, like, you know, like maybe at the interface end of the hard drive inside there. Yeah. Um, if somehow it made it that far, they'll cover like the, the typical for, you know, forensic kind of recovery you would do when you send a hard drive off to one of those companies. And nice, you know, they, they charge you like by the megabyte for those kinds of recoveries. And these guys are just saying that they'll cover the full contents of the drive. So that could total out to be, you know, it's like several thousand dollars worth of recovery potentially. And they just cover it. And it's just included with the, you know, with the device. So, Pretty cool stuff, right? So you can have, you know, if you, if you put these two guys together, th this is a terabyte by itself, mirrored, right? So you're worried about sort of disaster recovery there. And then you can have the Synology box backing up occasionally to, you know, to the I.O. drive. Or you can just, actually, it shows up as just a separate share. So, like, you, you would connect to your Synology device on your network, shows up just as if it was its own computer. And then under there, there'll be, like, a SATA share folder and that would go straight out to the to the uh, to the um io safe so pretty cool stuff you know it's uh, um i was i was pleasantly surprised by especially the synology box all the different 
you know, there's like a bunch of different plugins. All the NASAs these days have these things. Like there's plugin sort of infrastructure on them. Brian, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Where you can basically turn on and off different features. So you can have like an iTunes share, I mm-hmm. guess. You can have like a photo share, like media type sharing. Um, so all the other devices on your network can just connect to them as if that was a computer that was serving out all those different kinds of content. So, yeah, cool. It's pretty cool. Um, when the, we, when's uh, was, your, you're going to have an article up on this, I guess, this uh, week, I'm right? shooting for tonight, yeah. It's, it's pictures. Are all, everything's all done. I just need to get it in the website. Um, the, okay. uh, the iOS 8 by itself is for the speeds. If people are wondering about the speeds, it's basically uh, on eSATA, it's no different than just an eSATA like dock or an, an, another eSATA connected drive. So you'll see the same speed you would see just from that one terabyte in Hitachi. Just gives you the same, you know, it's as if there was nothing in the way. Um, you go to speed two, not so much. And then if you pass right. it through the Synology box, then you get similar speeds to what you would get even to the Synology's own internal storage. So you get like 50, 60, sometimes 70 meg per second, uh, just depending on how your network's configured. Which, by the way, for that, you need like jumbo frames and some of those other things. Like you'd need a jumbo frames enabled switch. Right. Other devices on your network have to be able to support that. Um, otherwise, it just falls That's fairly back common to, these days, isn't it, though? It, it is. Chances are, if you have any kind of recent devices on your network, you're just fine. Okay. You know, especially uh, probably any kind of a gigabit switch within the past year, thereabouts, is almost guaranteed to have that, that capability. All right. So uh, look for that review, performance, all that kind of stuff. Unfortunately, we won't be catching it on fire, which is a little bit of a letdown. We'll see if we can eh, work that out in a couple of weeks. We'll figure hey, it you've out. You've got we'll... WD 40 in a match. <laughs> I, I do, but this is just a rental. So I know that you can purchase the uh, ingredients for thermite on eBay. <laughs> I know this for a definite. Okay. Uh, now, listen, just saying. I brought this up. I brought this up because we know you, Ryan, and what? the IOS the IOSafe guy has seen some of the videos for our website in the past, apparently, and he specifically told me that it is not covered for thermite. <laughs> that is baloney. What if your house accidentally gets blown up through a thermite <laughs> <By> explosion? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're I mean, storing a bunch of aluminum in the shed for some floor. reason. And- <laughs> the U.S. Air Force accidentally dropped a thermite bomb on my house. house. Well, actually, just need... on this drive when I happened to have it out in a field. So there uh, I was. <laughs> so there I was. <laughs> Minding my own business when this plane just showed up. <laughs> I think it's reasonable. All right, so look for that. News type items. Um, NVIDIA announced, NVIDIA had their kind of investors call. There were a couple of news items from it. They did talk about uh, NVIDIA's the Tegra 3 processor. They're expecting to see 30 devices powered by Tegra 3 uh, by this year. They didn't really break down if that was going to be uh, Android tablets, Windows tablets, Windows 8, Windows 8 RT, whatever, wart, whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, I'm guessing it'll be a combination of some of those. They also announced that they're finally going to their their the company that they acquired last year named Isera. That is a manufacturer of baseband and RF technologies. Um, basically, that. Their, that company's LTE chip has finally been approved by AMD, which means we will now see Tegra 3 based LTE capable devices on the AT&T network and uh, I would assume pretty soon on the Verizon network as well, hopefully by the end of this year, because that's kind of been um, one of their stalling points for getting Tegra phones out to the group. Uh, and then if you see there at the bottom, we have the, the updated Tegra roadmap that shows um, uh, kind of an interesting information there so wayne was always kind of like the uh core that was going to be a little bit higher end maybe for like the kind of tablet notebook style designs for arm based systems Uh, and gray is now a new chip they've announced it's going to be available it's more for the smartphone and for the 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 super phone as they call them markets but it will integrate tegra and isera technology on a single chip for the first time as well. So they're making uh, making some headroom there. Uh, what was our other NVIDIA news? I'll do this a little bit out of order. Um, 
So this was kind of interesting. NVIDIA is now claiming, apparently, during a uh, one of the slides, I missed it during the slide, but they made sure they pointed it out to me after the fact, that the GTX 680 sales are outpacing the sales of the GTX 580 when it was released uh, week to week. So if we look at the graph, it says available to gamers worldwide, in GTX 680 sales uh, sales out. I don't know who wrote these slides, but they should be fired. Um, or, or maybe that's term- well, what's, terminology what's, what's I don't con- understand. What's confusing about that chart to me is if you look on the on the left, um, you know, on the y-axis, it's uh, sold out globally. Units sold out globally. Yeah. So it's that's th- they could be selling two units total, and they would have a whole bunch of sold out. Well, like sales. I, I asked about that specifically, <laughs> right? Because that did that wording did seem odd. And uh, where did I come in about that? Uh, the term "sold out" gave me a bit of pause. But when questioned, I asked them, "Is it fair to translate units sold out globally to units sold globally?" And they said yes. So it's not. Okay. It doesn't seem to be. Did you just say a, units sold globally? Yep. I, I didn't realize that NV got into that kind of trade. <clears throat> Yeah, anything to make a bunch. Yeah, well. So, so their point is, their point is that they're no selling. Sleep. That despite the rumors or whatnot of they're not being able to keep up with you know supply, demand, any of that magic, whatever economics stuff. Um, mm-hmm. Is it just that they're saying, look, we're actually producing more six eighties than we were producing five eighties? Is that the point of that chart? It's always. The argument has opened than there has been in previous generations. Um, yeah. yeah but, 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 but they've never given us firm numbers like to, to believe that. We just kind of had to take them at their word. This is the first time they've kind of presented it. And they still didn't give us like raw numbers, right? They're, they're presenting us relative numbers in comparison to a different product. Um, but at least that's something, right? Because the, I posed this question to Josh when I first got this information. Is that when the GTX 580 launched, do we remember these selling out do we remember these um having any kind of availability issues you know six weeks after launch i don't think we did no no it so was if, about two weeks of of tight and then after that you could buy pretty much whatever one you wanted pretty much pretty much so they're For saying six weeks out from launch the gtx 680 has sold 60 percent more than the gtx 580 did um, and if that's the case, if 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 this if we accept the information that they have presented to us in a factual fashion, um, then that's that backs up their claims that it's not an issue of yield. It's not an issue of them not being able to produce enough of the chips um, because of like. Well, it still is. Poor if design the is that high. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, no. We can go into that in a little bit more depth because if you yeah. think about it. GTX 580 was about double the size of the uh, GTX 670 or 680. And it was toasty. 280. Yeah, double the size. Yeah, die size. I mean, and this is, you know, 40 nanometers. GTX 580 on those wafers, you got, I, I think, 150 chips. The GTX 680, you're getting closer to, I think, 250 to 270. I mean, this is just kind of off the cuff. So <clears throat> you can do the math about how well you know it, it's you know it's it's sixty percent you know better sales, but it's almost double the size of the actual die, and so they've got some issues getting it produced. Well, I don't think anybody's ever argued that the twenty eight nanometer yields are better than the forty nanometer yields. That's for sure. Um, but the argument, you know, the thing that Nvidia has been fighting has been, you know. Uh, claims from many people that say NVIDIA has made a chip that is much more difficult to produce than AMD's Tahiti processor at the same 20, 28 nanometer node at the same you know foundry, right? And um, that's always been the, the kind of issue that NVIDIA is trying to, to battle against. And they're trying to counter that with information without being too specific, right? They don't want to say... I don't, you know, they don't want to say specifically how many GPUs they've sold. And, AM, and to be fair, AMD doesn't want to tell us that either. AMD doesn't want to tell us how many GPUs they've sold. It's all, it's very proprietary information, right? And AMD is doing, or I'm sorry, NVIDIA is probably doing a lot more 
wafer splitting between desktop and notebook parts because it seems like Kepler is making a push to the mobile market. A big laptop there, much larger than AMD's discrete GPU solutions. So it would make sense that they are going to um, maybe apply more of their wafer capability to the parts anyway because they, they could sell them. So at this point, we're, we're basically at the time where it's, all right, we just have to trust NVIDIA on this one as far as you can throw them, I guess, to each their own. Um, and the only real solution will be if we can get actual sales numbers from some reseller or we can just, you know, today when we talk about stock, there's actually two 680s in stock. For two days in a row, there have been two GTX 680s in stock at Newegg. Um, and as a, and that as was a much rejoicing. Just two. Yes. Just, just, it's just in danger of, of hitting the leaderboard. Yeah, two exactly. Days. I mean, no. as we record I, uh, this, they're still there. Yeah. I we think, gotta get I think we're going to get I think there was a bigger initial surge for the 680s as far as just people scrambling to buy them because I think there are a lot of people that may have passed on the 580s, right? And they were just sort of waiting. And they didn't know if they, oh, you I know, because the 680 is a car that you don't, you know, A, you don't necessarily have to upgrade that power supply if you hadn't done so in a while, right? Just because the power consumption is so much less. You know, you, ha you have people like trying to figure out, well, do I want to do two of them or, you know, trying to, trying to go for SLI. And then I definitely have to update my power supply. And I was actually in this exact same position. I was thinking about moving to a pair of 480s. And then this guy came out, and now I'm going to take the 480s and put them back on eBay, right? Because I just, why, why do that? One 680 is about equivalent to the two 480s and uses like a third of the, the combined power of those two prior cards. So it's, it's just a no-brainer, and it's, it's probably that way for a lot of people. So yeah, I, I would have to say that the initial demand for, a, for the 680 launch was just, I mean, all, just from my own hunch, has to be higher than what the I, I think it was. was. I, I would probably agree with that. So we'll, we'll see more as this kind of proceeds. And then I guess the last thing I'll mention here that they showed uh, at their investors meeting or talked about was uh, a new Asus ZenBook Prime. Prime being the 1920 by 1080 resolution version of these uh, Ultrabooks. This is the UX32 VD which is a really bad name <laughs> <laughs> yeah. for a laptop. Uh, the the ZenBook Prime the especially VD if you're version. putting it on your lap. Yeah, I think. Yeah, <laughs> I think Boy, that's VD really is supposed heat to up my parts. The the VD is supposed to indicate that you uh, have an NVIDIA discrete chipset in there. Um, so as I was joking with some of the NVIDIA guys here, uh, if it's got VD, it's got NVIDIA inside. So this one is an ultrabook design IPS display GTX or I'm sorry GT 620M Kepler. GPU, Optimus technology, all that kind of stuff. Uh, pretty snazzy looking. Three USB 3.0 ports, memory card reader, HDMI, and mini display port. Uh, and apparently it will be like $1,299. So uh, oh, I'm, I'm interested start, in this. After a year, it's going to start displaying a fever and start being a little <laughs> mentally unstable and leave <laughs> unsightly marks on your pants. It's all a result of the VD. Is that what you're telling and me? This, and, and this should have the better version of the Chicklet keyboard that that's like I think the last thing that between the checkout keyboard, like this the the usability of the keyboard and the uh, keyboard yeah. backlighting, I think those are the well, two this things one, that some people are waiting on. Yeah, and it's a little bit the the you'll notice if you look at the pictures on the side of it, the Verge uh, has a lot of them. Um, it's a little bit thicker than uh, the other Zen books that are already out, so it should allow for a little bit. Um, deeper uh, key travel spacing, which should improve that, I guess, uh, for a lot of people. Yeah, is, I think it's a, little, nice. it's a little bit thicker. To, like, it doesn't come to that, like, razor point so much, right? It just takes a little thicker towards the front. They, uh, the version has a chin. Yeah. That's so, just the swelling. There you go. Um, who wants to talk about HP apparently having 27,000 too many employees? Something Somebody's to got to tell me about it. <laughs> well, they had 27,000 too many employees. So, they, so they, they corrected that problem by no longer sending them a paycheck. Well, and they're going to do it over two years, right? And what, here's what I found really impressive with this. That's only 8% of their staff. 
like 27,000 employees is only 8% of their staff. That just seems, I, I guess I don't have any, any real um, uh, idea, like how many employees these kinds of just mega enterprises really have. But to think that 27,000 yeah. people is only 8% is a uh, pretty impressive, suggests, I guess. Yeah, except it for suggests that the plus what, well, AMD laid off 10% of their workforce and it was like 1,700 people. Yeah. See, yeah. So I think it was because I think they just got too bloated from time past, and it's just not the same way anymore. And I think they just kept their people on for too long, from the sounds of it. Three billion yeah. dollars are going to save by losing yeah. these twenty-seven thousand people, yeah. and they're going to toss that's it into the cloud. <laughs> Literally, that, that's what they're going to do. They're going to toss it into the cloud. What were they going to use a tribute? That's an average. That's an average salary of a hundred and eleven thousand one hundred and eleven dollars each employee. Well, okay, so they're considering... Well, like you're really pay. underpaying me, Ryan. <clears throat> yes, the, it's, no, no, Ryan, that's probably like... Cut benefits. Jeremy. Double my hey, income. Now. You know, hey. it's benefits and anything else they're adding in. You're the one who's yeah, yeah. on the way. That's, that's $111,000 uh, per of, of cost per, <laughs> per user, yeah. per employee, not actually but seller. Yeah. Really, under 10%, that's a shakeup. It's not so much a mass firing. I mean, yeah, it's a huge amount of people, and there are going to yeah. be... That's but the issue. Know, there's going to be a lot of unhappy people. There are. Yeah. Um, let's talk about another large enterprise company. We actually had a couple of stories from Dell. One is uh, some information about Dell's upcoming Latitude 10 tablet leaked out. This is a Windows 8 tablet. I know you guys are going to be super excited about all this barrage of Windows 8 tablets that are going to come out. A what is the screen size? Ten point one inch screen size, thirteen sixty six by seven sixty eight resolution, capacitive multi touch. Uh, and the, the, the reason in, this, the most important thing to say about this is what? that it's not an atom. No, it is a. It's not a the other one arm, the one that makes Windows eight do very limited. Correct. Things. So this yeah. is this yeah. is a full Windows eight, not Windows RT PC. Um, because yes. it, uh, it does have an Atom processor. It has the new Intel Clover Trail, which really isn't out yet, so we don't know a whole lot about the performance other than it's going to be a dual-core, hyper-threaded part uh, running at... I thought I had a frequency, but I guess I don't. But it does have hyper-threading, and it has something called Burst Mode, which sounds like a kind of somewhat limited version of uh, Turbo Boost. It yeah. offers, quote, quick bursts of extra performance when called upon. Um, I think that's supposed to be like a more aggressive version of Turbo Boost. Like it just like it really, really yep. pushes high, just like on one core or something. Um, but it, it only does it know, very the, short. The, the hope is for for these types of devices where touch interfaces are so uh, you can very easily discern when they're working well, when they're not. That response of when uh, somebody makes contact with the screen or something like that. I don't know. Yeah, uh, but otherwise, Xena, what are they using for graphics? Up to um, integrated Atom graphics. Oh, hmm. I mean, it's it's still it's still a GPU that is that is integrated onto that onto that uh, Atom SoC. So it's not going to be really impressive, and I think that maybe explains why we have a thirteen sixty six by seven sixty eight screen, right? If you have fewer yeah. pixels, you require less. GPU horsepower. Yeah. That is really kind of low, though, considering now, what's Jer out now. Mm. Oh, yeah. Jeremy, let's yeah. do three inch about telephones uh, with 1080p screens. And yeah, right. you've got this. And then the iPad is 2048 by whatever, yep. right? So. It's, it stands out as being maybe a little bit low. Um, Jeremy, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the Dell Copper? based stuff this is this was mm. i thought was pretty interesting well it's not bad i mean uh they're following Colexta and uh hp in sort of jumping into the idea that arm is in the server room whether you like it or not so what we're looking at uh is a sorry just doing a link it's a 3 rack of which they can fit up to i believe it was 16 uh, server nodes. Each of these nodes can hold up to four uh, via... Ah, where did it go? Sorry, 
Uh, anyways, it's about uh, um, Marvel Amata XP ARM based uh, 1.6 gigahertz quad core. Each of those can address up to eight gigs of, of RAM, and there's four two and a half inch uh, 720 or 7200 RPM drives on it. So altogether, you're looking at each one of these little blades sucking up in the neighborhood of maybe 40, 50 watts tops running full out, and you can fill this entire rack with them. So you're looking at what is going to be an obnoxiously parallel, ridiculously power saving uh, rack mount server. So if you're running like a, a store end front or just trying to run something which is going to be dealing with a lot of connections and wants to be dealing with a lot of different things separately, it's going to be brilliant. Uh, we're not quite sure what the cost is going to be because as of right now, it is mostly just a rollout uh, to prove that this is going to work, you're not going to be able to buy them at any point in time. But, you know, it's really an aggressive move by a big server company to bring ARM right into the server room in a very cost-effective way and with something that is, you know, aimed at a very uh, specific customer type. So instead of just saying, you know, here, try this server, it might be good enough for you. They're like, no. We're looking for front-end stuff. Uh, we're looking for a couple of different uh, web apps, which you know are used a lot online, and just making an ARM uh, solution, which is going to be utterly brilliant, take hardly any power whatsoever, and be very scalable because the, the little the server nodes, so you, you pop in one processor, it's going to work. You need more power, you pop in two, three, four, and then start filling up the entire rack. It's interesting, and it'd be interesting to see what Intel is going to do. We already know uh, AMD uh, has, has just bought a nice little company and is sort of looking into trying to figure out how uh, they can leverage a bunch of Atom interconnects, which is going to be kind of interesting. Because, you know, after buying a C-Micro, there's going to be some uh, low-power stuff coming from AMD. And last week we were talking that they're looking at, you know, not producing the ultra-high-power processors that Intel is. They're now looking more at producing low-power stuff that's just good enough. So there's there's a battle on in the server room, and it's just going to get more interesting from here. Josh Rowland, you have any more thoughts on this, this uh, kind of arm push the server world? There were some... Uh... Some some comments people immediately started going towards. Hey, why are there spindles in there? They're wasting all their power on hard drives. Well, they're just two and a half inch drives. They're probably consuming like three to five watts a piece. There, that's not a lot of power. And idle. They're probably even less than that. Um, not only that, but you're going for blade servers with a I would assume mass storage um, going on in there. Then they need just that. They need mass storage, right? It's it's yeah. one drive. It's one drive per core. From the looks of it, right? It's four four cores and a blade and one drive per core, so it's basically as if it's 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 one of them is its own PC, like not PC, but you know standalone unit with connected to one of those drives. Um, so it's just not cost effective yet to be putting all that on solid state, unless the purpose of the thing is specifically for something that's going to be solid state, you know, specifically for solid state. But in that case, you're not so worried about a huge cluster like that. You're just worried about you know, a few devices with very high-end solid state in them. So that would be that would basically be its own, you know, its own chassis sitting alongside one of these things would be like the thing that had all your solid state in it. Um, but yeah, for all the number crunching and the back-end stuff, this is that can do a lot of work in a very very small space. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Um, something else that was interesting, uh, where's this at? Oh, actually, OCZ launched the Agility 4 SSD based on IndyLink's Everest 2. So do we know anything else about this other than that, Alan? No, nope, no, nope, we don't have hard numbers. They're not even really shipping yet. Uh, they weren't, uh, they didn't even sample yet, as a matter of fact. That, that's one of those, so every time, every once in a while, OCZ just announces something before, you know, they come out with the announcement before the review. It's not a coordinated review effort kind of deal. Mm -hmm. Um, but from what we know in the past, I mean, Agility 4, it will, it's going to be asynchronous RAM instead of synchronous, you know, most likely IMFT, Intel, Micron, Flash. Usually that's the, that's the, the path they've been on for a very long time now. Um, so the, your Vertex has the synchronous style. Your 
um, Agility has the asynchronous style memory, which is just it's slightly cheaper because it doesn't have to uh, communicate in on a synchronous uh, using a synchronous protocol. It uses asynchronous, which and actually sometimes is better because asynchronous has slightly less latency on some kinds of things versus synchronous, hmm. depending on how they have it configured. Um, that was actually a thing back when they had the Vertex 2 and the Agility 2. There were some people that were getting better numbers for certain workloads out of an Agility 2. right? So that's, it just depends on how it's configured, really. Um, but the key thing is that the, the memory costs less, the flash memory. So uh, some of the comments on, on that post, I believe, were uh, that they were finding them already for less than a dollar a gig. Which is pretty much might wow. mean that this is this is the drive that consistently just gets put as its price being you know at or below a dollar a gig versus having to wait for a sale to come around, which is what you have to do for just about everything else right now. You know, it's it's close, but it's just not there, right? It's not there permanently. Right. Um, yeah. So I mean, I would expect the performance would be similar to a Vertex Four. But I will qualify that by saying that the Vertex 4 performance is still a moving target because the firmware is, you know, still sort of jumping around. The performance changes as they come out with new versions, as they tweak it, whatever you want to call it. You know, right. something I <clears throat> wanted to, you know, holler out because, you know, I know there's been some discussion on it about the quality of OCZ drives. And I've got two older OCZ drives here. <clears throat> and I've you know not had a problem now. That's not much of a sample size, but everything you read about, it seems like OCZ is just so aggressive on getting these new products out that the firmware usually is mm, half baked, and so you're just kind of begging for issues if you get one right off the bat and hope to have you know Intel type quality. But uh, I know for myself. You know, I, I waited to pull the trigger on that uh, Agility 3 for quite a few months. And once I did, I updated to the latest firmware, and it's been, you know, nothing but, but solid for me. I've got one of the Samsung-based original OCZ drives that you sent me, Alan. So, you know, yep. as it, what would you say about the quality? I mean, am I terming this right? Am, am, am I in the house, or, or are there some other manufacturing issues that they have rather than just being really too aggressive on the firmware and ship well I think product. the um I, I think for the quality thing it, you know I had that issue back a while back about the bad capacitors on the motherboards and oh yeah all these different motherboard manufacturers all started getting a bad rap simultaneously because of this bad batch of capacitors because a Taiwanese company ripped off another one and that we, they had like the formula was incomplete or something for the electrolyte in these capacitors, right? So a bunch of people just got a bad name for a batch, like or a particular, you know, round, uh, wedge of time. And then similarly, Western Digital went through a thing right around the time where they were making 250 to 400 gig drives where they were just pushing the envelope too hard and their drives were running too hot and they were just getting head failures. Um, you know, and, and so they went through a spat where it was like that too. That was focused just to one company, right? Uh, this is the same, quarter, same, same sort of deal happened but that happened with anything related to Sandforce, three gigabit per second, specifically, right? That those Sandforce went through a thing where the the firmware that they were sending out, even before the, any given company tweaked it or didn't tweak it or whatnot, um, the firmware had some some issues, and it, and they were the kinds of issues where the drive, if it was coming out of standby in a certain way or in a certain kind of configuration, it would just do. It would do something, I, I think most likely what it was doing was something with the metadata, where it saves data that's, basically it's data describing data. So metadata is like the stuff that talks about how the data is organized on the flash memory and all that stuff. And if you, if you mess that up, even the slightest, the drive's a brick. It's just, you just can't get to what you're trying to get to. Except what made it worse was that the way that the sand forest was falling into that mode it was just the drive was a brick like completely like you couldn't secure erase it you couldn't just redo a firmware update you it wouldn't even you know initialize so the drive was basically literally a brick and you had to arm it and that was horrible right and i think that occ specifically got a bigger uh version of that or a, a, a larger piece of that bad rap was because i think they were the ones selling the most sandforce drives right they were really pushing mm. it when they when you know when when vertex 
the, the vertex line, the agility lines, they were pushing them, and they they must have been the largest company selling those units. So naturally, you know, the bulk of the bad rap falls right on them, right? Um, Intel, likewise, they released a model that had San, a Sandforce chip in it, and it took them over a year to come out with it. And they were in development, I, I would say, within a month of when OCZ started going down that path. Intel probably started down that path just as well because they were looking for a way to move towards you know, 6 gigabit and everything else. So uh, Intel held off, and they, you know, just to make sure that that was where it needed to be for Intel standards, right? So OCZ is sort of, you, you know, I think you nailed it, Josh. They're sort of, they're more on like the overclocker slash bleeding edge slash, you know, we want to try to get this into the people's hands sooner than later. Um, and the firmware, ha the performance hasn't jumped around horribly on firmware stuff until this most recent generation, until Vertex 4. And I think that's because, as was leaked a little while back, it's actually Marvell in there, right? So it's not something that they were dealing with before. Correct. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, and, and you're dealing with a completely different, it, it's almost like going between x86 and ARM architecture. You're talking about a completely different SSD controller. Um, so Except for if they're all based on ARM processors. Yes, but the actual pipeline within, like the hardware pipeline within that chip, in other words, the way that the protocols that it uses internally to talk amongst the different parts of itself uh, specifically the parts of it that actually speak to and get data from the flash memory, right? Those are going to have different tricks, if you will, associated with them. So to try to get, um, you know, you can't just basically take the code for what was running well on a Sandforce-based SSD and just like, quote-unquote, port it over to a Marvell and just expect to get the same kind of results. You, you just can't. It's, the, you know, the, and that's totally evidenced by what we saw, right? When I did that initial review on Vertex 4, they had an, an initial, like, shipping firmware, and then there was a, the update, and they were so... I mean, it was literally like a different drive going from one to the other. Um, so there's, there's definitely a lot of tweaks to be made uh, that can be made and to completely change the behavior of a drive just with firmware. Um, but I will say that the Marvell, you know, the controller is very capable. Um, there's just really, you know, you don't hear... First of all, how many like Marvell based SSD failure? Like, have you heard? Have any of you heard any kind of like Marvell based drive I, failing? I have not. Well, right. the Micron, the the Micron original, I think the what C fours, the they had C three hundred. Real no, the C three hundred. Yeah, they had some real issues, and I think the first couple of weeks of C four hundred. But but that again is all firmware, you know, bricking the drive, yes. doing whatever. But I think you know the chips themselves. Well, I mean, how many times have you ever really heard of, of Sandforce chip failures? It's It's been all firmware. It, I, I'm, I'm pretty darn sure it's all been firmware related. Yeah, I think that what made it slip into that mode where you couldn't even update it or, or reset it or wipe it uh, to start over, I, I think that was because it was doing a very low level, like a boot ROM level sort of thing internally. And somehow it was corrupting that stuff that it had to access and then it just couldn't. You know, it just got stuck in a do loop as soon as you turned it on, basically. Then it got stuck in that loop before it even started talking to the PC. Um, but really, that's, that says a lot about, you know, when the base firmware that you get from the company, there, there's mm -hmm. some things, you, you can't re-engineer the entire thing bottom to top. That would take too long. Even OCZ is not going to do something like that, right? So there, there are pieces of that firmware that they're just going to have to leave in place. Um, they're not just going to be like, oh, back to the drawing board. Okay, here's our, you know, here's our controller. Now we're just going to, you know, redo. And the how whole many thing, people right? really know assembly for ARM? So <clears throat> it's another good question. I mean, that's the low-level type of firmware stuff you got to deal with anyway. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, I, I do work. I do work with, uh, you know, reverse engineering for for x86 based stuff. And even that is the smallest. You know, a file that I work with that's even smaller than the firmware file for an SSD. It would still take me like months to try to work through and figure out exactly how front, that thing worked front to back. Not even trying to remake it myself, just trying to figure it out, right? So, um, yeah, you just can't expect, you know, a company's just not going to have enough people to throw at that even, that, that know what the heck they're doing to that level, right? A, a given company's only going to have a few people 
they're going to have a small team that can do that sort of work. Um, and OCZ probably has more than, than, than most other ones, right? Because you get like, you know, of course, they're a Patriot. Most of the other companies, they just sort of rubber stamp whatever the firmware was that came from whatever that company was. And it just, you know, that's what goes out on the drive. It's like, here's the, we, we just have rebranded this product. Here it is. It has our name on it. We'll give you our warranty and our support. But that's basically what you're getting. You know, that's the difference in what you're getting from whichever company you chose, right? With a few notable exceptions. Those are OCZ, Intel. You know, Intel always reworks the firmware. Um, that sort of thing. Intel's got the R&D budget to <clears throat> rewrite every stinking firmware on the planet as far not as only that, Not only that, but they have more people with know-how. That's, that, that's, just, that's just a simple yep. fact. Th- those guys are way up there. On the whole, let's. You know. um, you know, so speaking of Intel, they actually did put out a video today just to completely change the subject on you guys on how to make a processor. Um, uh, that uh, Scott actually posted his news up on the on the site. There's a link to the video as well as a really 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 good PDF document. If you are interested in kind of like the process that goes from uh, sand to a chip in your computer, it's actually a really interesting video. Um, the video, well, the, uh, let me say that again. The video is kind of simplistic and there's no voiceover. It's just like there are several places if, you're, if you don't read the PDF document where the video makes no sense. But I do love the idea of saw blades, like literally like the saw blades you buy at Home Depot somehow are responsible for cutting up the wafers and dividing up the chips and stuff. Yeah, because, you know, <clears throat> I said, you know the silicon is, is so, you know, not fragile. You can't fracture it whatsoever with, you know, Nope. Not be cutting procedures. Nope. See, you're right. You're exactly, you're spot the, on. The biggest thing I found interesting about this is that they do like an electroplating layer of copper at some point. Um, yeah, that's know, the copper the, deposition of the, the wires. I mean, it's... Right. it's but, but that's not the part that really stuck out to me is like, wow. The wow part was when they p- are able to polish that layer down. Like, what on earth do you use... It's what grit of sandpaper. It's not physical. In the video, in the video, little tiny gnomes like, with sandpaper. In the video, they're using like a hand uh, sander. Yeah, it's a rotor. Yeah, it looks it looks like a dual sander. orbital yeah. car sander that they yeah. hit with this thing in the video, and it's like uh, somehow I don't think they're just you know. <laughs> there's like little swirl marks. No, there, the there's like no it. physical interaction with the wafer. <laughs> yeah, it's light. And washing it with chemicals. It's somebody just, in the chat room says yeah. it's moon it's uh, cat tongues. You're right. Yes. I think oh, you're right. Of course. Yes. They, they just they, lick they the pour, wafers. They pour milk. <laughs> they pour milk on the wafer and then But only the in certain spots. It. Uh, but it is cool that it, it they it, actually show the lithography it, progress from process for making yeah. the 3D FETs, right? Because we hadn't seen that yet. We had just seen just pictures of what the 3D FET looks like. We were like, how on earth do they do that? So this actually details all those individual steps of, of that process, which is pretty cool to watch. I agree. Um, I see the video out uh, on page there. Um, so it needs stuff. Uh, what else we got? Oh, yeah, GPU stock update. We mentioned it already. Believe it or not, ladies and gentlemen, the GTX 680 is in stock. I'm going to click this link just to make sure it's actually... Oh, oh we're, down. we're down to one. At the end of the show, there were two GTX 680s in stock. And now there's just a single one, the Zotac Amp card. Uh, $549, it's so it's, it's more expensive, but it does have a 92 megahertz overclock as well. So that's, that's pretty significant. Ooh. Thanks, chat room. For buying up the last five of those things. <laughs> yeah. Now, if you're looking for a GTX 670, though, which is probably the the new favorite card, um, there are there's like six or seven of those in stock at Newegg, um, starting at 399 for those. So uh, that's that's not too bad. Um, so there you go. We we I, you know we, we complain about them when they're not in stock, and now that there's a single one in stock. We'll, we'll praise them until maybe by the time we get to the very end of the show, it'll be gone. Also notice praise the GTX them. 690 is still never in stock again. I actually had an interesting conversation with a guy at Fry's here in Austin, Texas, 
Um, Because I went to their GPU shelf. I was like, let's see what actual retail availability is like. They only had one 670. Um, He said they get people calling in about the 680s and the 690s all the time. And I said, how many 690s have you had in the store and sold since launch? And he went, two. They've had two. Yeah. I was like, well, okay, there you go. He said they sold right away. Um, Of course. But but, uh, and I said, they're, they're, they're probably on eBay now. But they sold right away. So there you go. There's our there's our weekly, semi weekly, almost weekly stock. And then uh what I is guess this? I, you know, there's a go on with GPU stock. <clears throat> Just real oh, okay. quick. I guess that AMD is is having some issues uh, supplying the high end seventy nine seventies as well. I mean it's not as easy to that. notice. But <clears throat> if you kind of look at uh, what they have in stock, some of the higher end SKUs are, are really absent. And have been for quite some time. Some of the high so, end SKUs of the seventy nine seventy, you mean? Is that what yeah, you're like the 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 Lightning R seventy nine seventy. You just can't find them. At least I mm. couldn't last week. Well, <clears throat> I mean, there's probably twenty seventy nine seventies listed on Newegg in stock. So the super high ends, I see what you're saying, but I mean, there's actually you can actually go to the second page of seventy nine seventies. Yeah, what's up with that? But not everything is rosy at 28 nanometer for both. But AMD has handled their supply seemingly a little bit better. I don't so know. Uh, who, who wants to tell me about Crisis 2 and EA and Valve? Sure. Making up? <clears throat> I will. Go. Because that's me. Uh, yeah, you remember uh, last year, about this time, Crisis 2 suddenly disappeared from Steam. And it was because Steam, well, rather Valve and EA, had some issues about add-ons and uh, DLC, and it just didn't work out between them. <clears throat> EA had Origin. They thought, hey, we're going to really hammer them with that, and we're going to you know, create this shining... You're not permitted to view these things because you're not old enough, Berk. Berk. You, but anyway, <laughs> <clears throat> Origin was, was going to be the answer to Steam, and uh, as everybody knows from their Battlefield 3 experiences, that's not exactly the case and so it's kind of interesting to see that ea is now going back to valve and steam to sell the crisis to maximum edition which has all of the dlc already installed well but that's the that's the key though i mean that well, was all uh, installed in one price yeah yeah but valve's uh issue was with the dlc and the the funny thing is it apparently turns out it was Crytek that did it, not EA. Really? Yeah. I don't know. I, I was kind of curious about that because, of course, the question leads into, well, what about Dragon Age 2, Battlefield 3, Mass Effect 87, or whatever they're up to now? Uh, you know, are these guys going to be coming back? And so a guy over at Rock, Paper, Shotgun looked into it, talked to a few people, and no, it was Crytek with the maximum edition, change some of the stuff in the DLC part of it, which was what Valve was upset about, and that's why it's back. So don't bet on seeing the EA games on Steam anytime soon, I don't think. You mean I can't get my Battlefield 3 on Steam? I don't think so. Damn you. Well, EA way to doesn't... Go, uh, tech. Yeah. EA won't give up... Uh, because uh, Origin rocks they, so yeah, good. It, it's like the Hatfields and the McCoys, you know, they're, they're just never going to get along. <laughs> All right. Uh, so let's get into our hardware software picks of the week. Mine is not going to be Time Warner Cable Internet. Um, instead, uh, if you're watching the video version, you'll notice I have a new headset on. It's bigger. It's more Allen-sized. Um, you would think maybe that just my head shrunk, but instead of my head shrinking, the, the, ear, the ear cups got bigger. Uh, so this is the Corsair Vengeance 2000 series of headset, and uh, it's wireless, uh, which I do like a lot, the ability to kind of get up from your chair uh, without having to worry about disconnecting yourself and that kind of stuff. It's got a volume rocker on the side. I'm going to do a little write-up on these this week uh, as well. Uh, it's got your boom mic. It uses a USB to um, 
uh, to, to, to connect. It gets about 10 hours of battery life of usage. It charges through USB, um, micro USB connection. So it's an integrated internal battery. Um, so far, so good. And I think we're going to try to do this live. Let's see how many things we break. Uh, but uh, so this podcast I've been recording with a, with a higher end USB mic. Um, so let's let's see if I can change the audio to this new microphone without screwing up Burke's ears. And, uh, so now we'll be crashing. listening to Ryan's lower end. So here's so this is still the original microphone, and now let's turn on uh, the Vengeance 2000 microphone. I so, do not want to hear Ryan's lower end. So this is my lower end. This is the Corsair Vengeance 2000. So to tell me, guys, what's it sound like? Sounds like you're Timmy. talking out of your... Yes, lower end. It's, it's it sounds lower end. You sound like you're talking through a uh, cardboard tube attached to a microphone. Mm. High end's completely gone. Well, you just got like this uh, fake. Uh, 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 how is it any better now? As I as I rearrange the microphone to my face. Oh, you're flat. The sound feels different kind of where you place the microphone at. Yeah? No? Yes? No? We'll go back bit. to the sample. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. All right. Go to the so high obviously, end. I mean, it's not meant for studio recording, obviously. It's it's supposed to be meant for gaming and that kind of stuff, and it does pretty good. The audio level, audio quality that has 50 millimeter drivers is, is pretty good um, so far, just in my kind of testing throughout the, day, uh, throughout the last couple of days. So uh, let's see. Now I will switch back uh, to the original yeah. microphone. Wow! I mean, sounds... this this is this is a hundred and fifty dollar microphone for just this purpose, right? Just for podcast recording. So, this is not the yeah, it sounds the pretty transparent. <clears throat> <laughs> uh, it sounds this microphone sounds better when you point the right end at your face, though. I found out several weeks ago. Um, that's, so that's th- true for a lot of things. <laughs> uh, one hundred forty nine dollars. You know they're they're kind of expensive for for a headset, but they are wireless uh, and they they do sound pretty good in terms of the audio quality. Just in listening to music and watching TV and that kind of stuff, and I do like the flexibility of. Um, I'm I'm in a, a small apartment right now, and I can basically walk around the entire apartment with the headphones on and 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 stay within its forty foot, um, forty to fifty foot RF range, uh, which is which is which is kind of nice. So. Um, you know, I can continue to ignore my wife no matter where she is in which room, as long as I have my headphones on and the volume turned up. So there you go. That's you my. You can pick. only. Who's next? They will only. You can only ignore that for so long. Trust me. <laughs> Eventually, they catch on. Yeah. Or throw right. things. Throwing things is bad, but it happens. Mm. Yep. Jeremy, what's up? Well, you know, if you've got an extra 10 grand lying around, and I mean, who, who doesn't have an extra 10 grand lying, lying around? Uh, you can toss in on the Carmageddon Reincarnation uh, Kickstarter, which has passed the project uh, goal. So it will be coming out on Windows. If they beat 600,000, they're going to be coming out on Linux and on Apple. But the thing is, if you were to, say, throw in the $10,000, then not only are you going to get a copy of the game, which is nice, but you'll be flown to the UK. Uh, shiny, or not shiny. Uh, uh, they'll, they'll pick you up in their Carmageddon uh, Range Rover. You'll get a VIP tour of the studio, the chat. They will take you out and drink you until you bleed. They'll stagger you to a curry house and uh, feed you until at least you guys get kicked out. As well, uh, you are going to be in the game as one of the drivers. You are going to be a victim. You may even show up on some posters. And the best part about it all is you're helping make a new incarnation of the game that the Pope actually condemned by name. Come on. How could you not do it? Got $10,000 I can borrow? Where do I sign? (laughs) Oh, I I already gave (laughs) him. For 15 you get the actual Steam version as well as an on-Steam version. They, they call it the DRM This edition. Nice. Pretty sweet. All right, Alan, or wait, who's next? Josh, what do you got? 
Well, you know, <clears throat> I was originally going to say this, but looking how my internet service really stinks tonight, I don't even know if you guys can see me because I literally cannot see you. Optimum Online, who used to be Bresden here in Wyoming and around Colorado and other places, <clears throat> they it's offer you, Josh. The, the, it's, it's the video back to us is broken for everybody. So Burke, you broke it. Burke is all broken up. <laughs> well, that's good then. Anyway, I, I feel better about myself and about my internet connection and saying that, you know, for an extra 14 bucks a month, I get 30 5. Well, 30 megabit down, 5 megabit up. Makes me happy for only 14 extra bucks a month, which that's, pretty that's nice. like two it's like two Taco Bell meals. That it's almost as stable. <laughs> yeah, so Oh, sorry. You're good to go. All right, Alan, what do you got? Uh, I'm actually going to recommend uh, this Synology box, although there is a little catch here to this that I didn't mention earlier, is that right. this box is like 300 bucks. Ugh. It's kind of up there, but it is a very, very, very... I mean, it's cheaper than you would spend to build a system just to do those tasks, right? And it's very small and just sits out in the middle of nowhere, in your house somewhere, and, and it, it goes, sounds like a lovely goes, life, you know. You know, it's 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 good. I'm 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 impressed with the performance. Um, but I will also plug uh, internet stuff because I didn't realize I just did this. Actually, I think I might have inadvertently prompted Josh to spend more money on his internet mm, because it was yeah, well, yeah. what was that was mm -hmm. that me? Because I because it was like yeah, it was actually like an extra fifteen or twenty a month or something to go from twenty slash two to thirty slash three for me on Time Warner. Nice. Um, so I was just like, ah, what the heck? Although, there's a catch, because if you have a Doxus 2.0 modem, uh, depending on what kind of infrastructure you're on, sometimes they tend to, like one channel tends to cap out at about 25-ish. So, and I think that's actually what I'm seeing. So I'm, I'm able to get 3 megabit up just fine, but um, the downstream didn't jump from an even 20 to an even 30 like I was expecting. It's more like a sort of a jittery 25 to 27. And not, you know, not because of like excessive traffic or anything like that. It's just, it's just like, a, it just sort of rides an inconsistent line. So I think that once you get past the 25 point, uh, you really want to go Doxus 3.0 and because that's a, a modem that can do channel bonding and stuff like that. So it actually combines two channels at the, at a very low level, uh, it's basically as if it was just the same one connection. It's not like the very, very old school cable where you could like get two accounts and try to multi-link them together. This is right. actually like at this is actually at the you know at the at the level one of the OSI model, you know, like data link layer and stuff like that. Anyway, um, or level two. Um, I like my Doxus three. So, Alan, get to the stinking point. <clears throat> what you pick? No, the you don't have one, do you? No, you I said don't have one. That's well, I'm, I'm going to just hold up some storage thing and say this is my pick. <laughs> are you are you seriously complaining that I did a storage I'm, related pick? I'm complaining. I, I love this battery recharger. It was <laughs> right pick. next to me. It's so good, so my good. Pick, Rail my back. Car keys, my so car underrated. Keys are so awesome. My pick is this $50 oh, these Puffs Plus. This, this They're keychain. so soft. This keychain they is They moisturize awesome. my nose. <laughs> these alligator clips. Oh, God. <laughs> All right. So, when, so someone that's from Ryan be yelling at me about the, no, no, about no, the no. obscure picks. Yeah. <sighs> that's going to be this week's edition of the PC Perspective Podcast. <laughs> um. You know what? We don't 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 call us. We don't deserve it. Uh, <laughs> bcper.com slash podcast is the URL to share. You know all the other all the other URLs you can go to to uh, find us. YouTube.com slash PCPer, Facebook, Twitter, G plus.to, all of those slash PCPer, and you will find us. Uh, and of course, visit PCPer.com. Don't forget about the survey contest. If you go to PCPer.com, look for the uh, the contest survey. Uh, and fill that out and let us know all of your little 
opinions on stuff, uh, write whatever you want in the comments, including that the podcast is the best or worst thing you've ever listened to. And we, I don't know, sometimes we listen to that kind of stuff. So that's it. Uh, we're going to, we're going to end the show on that glorious note and the pain. <laughs> and, and, and we're going to end the pain on that note too. I'm Ryan Trout. I'm Jeremy Hellstrom. I'm Josh Walworth. And I'm Alan Malentano. <laughs> Bye. <laughs> <laughs> Don't attend your own funeral as a guy named Phil Shifley.